Greetings, drawers. Today we will begin to discuss perspective. In this lecture, I will first go over the basic concepts of perspective, uh, including a little bit of history that will hopefully help you to relate uh, or uh, relate some of the struggles that you may or may not be having to some of the struggles that people have had historically before they had uh, a concrete system uh, for, for looking at leader perspective. Right. Uh, second, I will discuss the three main types of perspective, one, two, and three-point perspective, respectfully. And then finally, uh, we'll wrap up by taking a look at some photographic examples that show the, 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 the linear perspective system uh, in the actual real world and, and demonstrate that it's not just a trick or a gimmick, but an actual real thing right, that represents um, something. All right. Uh, so to get started, let's jump in a little bit with uh, the basic concept. What is perspective? Right? So you hear people say all the time, uh, well, for, for one, uh, you'll hear art students complain all the time about how difficult perspective is and how they don't like it because it's all math and plotting lines and all this stuff. Um, but I think you have to you know, sort of you know, you know, step back a little bit and, 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 and think about you know, what exactly perspective really is. Right? So um, somebody might ask you, you know, what is your perspective on, uh, the, uh, on, on politics? Right? You know, don't answer that publicly. Right? But uh, um, you know, what is, your, what is your, 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 your perspective on that? Or what is your perspective on religion or, or the environment or, or any big sort of issue? Right? And, and what people are really kind of saying with that is that they're saying, you know, where do you stand on this issue? Right? Um, that's a, a metaphorical way of using perspective. Right? You're saying, you know, you know, my stance on an issue is this. Right? But in drawing, what we actually do is we're we're taking it very literally. Right. So what we're actually saying uh, when we're talking about perspective is where do you stand? No, like literally, like where are you standing? Right. So right now, my perspective. Right. I'm standing right here and I'm looking. A little camera uh, in front of me, uh, but, but, but I'm, I'm looking at you, right? So, so that is my perspective. You're sitting on the other side of that camera. You're looking and you're seeing this, right? So, if I move over here, this is a different perspective, and what I'm seeing is different. Right? So, that's that's what we're really talking about. Right? We're talking about where we specifically are standing. Is the viewer standing here, or is the viewer standing here? Right? Where is the viewer way up here? Right? Where, where exactly are you? Right? And that's a very sort of literal sort of thing. And there's a set of mathematical rules that we're going to use in order to, uh, in order to figure that out exactly. Right? Okay, so, so that's, that's basically what, what I think that we're talking about with, with perspective is, is where we stand and, and where the viewer is standing when they're looking at a drawing, a painting, a photograph, etc. So next we're going to look at a couple of historical examples that I think are going to help you to relate and, uh, and relate to some of the struggles that uh, people learning how to draw who haven't been properly exposed to the perspective system uh, are, are maybe sort of seeing things. And so this is uh, an example uh, from Herculaneum. It is a, uh, a, a Roman painting. Uh, and the reason why we're starting with the Romans is because the Romans and their forebears, the Greeks, uh, were uh, the first group uh, that was really, really interested in representing the natural world. Um, and representing the natural world is not the be-all and end-all, uh, but it is what, similar to what we're doing in an observational drawing course. Right? So we're trying to represent the world as we see it, uh, and so too were uh, the Greeks and Romans. Uh, there aren't as many uh, surviving examples of Greek paintings. Uh, this happens to have survived because it was covered up uh, when Mount Vesuvius uh, exploded in 79 AD. Um, and it's also a particularly good example. And uh, a couple of different things. First off, uh, uh, it actually shows uh, there are two, two basic types of, of perspective, uh, which is uh, one is atmospheric and the other one is linear. Now what we're gonna focus on in, in our course in, in rendering is, is the linear part. In the painting course, you might focus more on uh, the atmospheric part. But you can see a little bit of atmospheric um, uh, in this uh, atmospheric perspective because as 
the, um, the things move farther back into the space, um, they get a little bit lighter. And what, what ends up happening is, uh, as when we look far away, uh, things get farther and farther away from us, uh, there's more and more um, uh, just things that, that disrupt, disrupt the, um, the light waves as they come to us. Everything from uh, atmospheric pollution, uh, which existed then just as it exists now, uh, things like um, uh, things that affect the, how the light comes, which is part of the reason why when we talk about you know, uh, driving up to Colorado, the Purple Mountains Majesty in the song, you know, the, the, the mountains appear different colors farther away. That's all components of atmospheric perspective, and that's for another course. Um, the, um, uh, and, it, and, and the other one is, of course, linear perspective, which has to do with specifically how the structures move away from us. Right? And so you can tell by looking at this painting right, that, uh, that they're trying to represent a naturalistic space, right? um, just like what we're trying to do. A uh, quick little bit about the backstory uh, on, on this one. Um, uh, there we have uh, baby Hercules, uh, or Heracles, depending on who you're looking at. Um, and uh, he is the product of a union between Zeus and who is his, his father and, uh, and a mortal woman who's his mother. And Zeus had this thing where he liked to transform himself into animals and other things and, uh, and have relations with, uh, with human women. Uh, so anyways, uh, this is what's sort of happening here. And so the characters that you're looking at are um, young Hercules and his mortal father, uh, who is married to his mother. Uh, and uh, he's wrestling snakes because Zeus's wife, Hera, um, doesn't like the activities of her husband, and so she has sent snakes to destroy the baby. And of course, because he's uh, you know, Zeus's son, he has these uh, these fantastic powers uh, and strength. And uh, I, I love this painting because you see um, his father, uh, his mortal father, uh, you know, reflecting on why is it that my uh, my son has these incredible powers, and then you see his mother, who has this sort of look of. To me, it always kind of says, oh, no, I'm so busted. <laughs> so, anyways, um, but enough of the, the sort of the fun parts of the story and whatnot. Uh, uh, the uh, little different from the Disney version. The, um, uh, when we look at the painting, you know, we see some very specific um, uh, attempts to render things moving back in space. And so the main thing that I'm looking at is the plinth in the background. Right? And if you look at the various lines, you can see that this line right here right, is closer to us, and this line over here is farther away from us. Right? And so the line that's farther away from us appears to be smaller right, because it's moving away from us in space. Right? And an example of that is, is as I move back in space, tripping over, right, as I move back in space, I get smaller. And as I come forward in space, I get larger, right? So, so, so we understand that that's how that works. The place where they're running into a little bit of a problem is on the top section of this uh, of this stone piece here, right? So you look at this little section over here. This line, right, is closer to us, and this line is farther away from us, and yet they are the same size. Right? That's a very sort of common mistake that people make, is that they want to, they, they have this angle that's going back, and they have this other angle that's going back, and they just repeat that angle, right? because it's, um, it's not that it's, it's just quick and easy, it's just, it just sort of happens. Mm -hmm. right, let's move on to another uh, example. Right, this is a manuscript piece, uh, um, a manuscript drawing uh, from a very short little period called um, uh, Charlemagne's Renaissance or the Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, and it's really interesting because uh, after Rome falls, right, we go into what are called the quote unquote dark ages. Right? And there's this sort of like myth out there, this idea out there that, that when that happened, everybody just forgot all the classical learning of the Greeks and Romans and everybody just kind of became stupid. And, uh, and, and I, really, I really don't like that idea. And I think that what really sort of happened is that um, as Christianity sort of took over, uh, people became interested in something different, right? And the early Christians, uh, it, the early Christians weren't as interested in the natural world, and they viewed the natural world very differently. So they didn't seek to render it, and they didn't seek 
um, studying the natural world, uh, or they didn't see studying the natural world um, in the same way that the Romans did. But what's interesting is that when Charlemagne comes into power, he wants to appear more Roman, right? He's trying to usher in a, a second Roman empire, right? Um, somebody else will try to usher in a third Roman empire at another point in time. So this is not, this, this type of idea is not sort of all that uncommon. And one of the things that he does is he orders his court to be more Roman, right? So there's this idea out there, they know exactly how to do that. And so you can see here the, um, the four um, evangelists uh, in, in this image uh, are wearing Roman style togas. Right? Uh, and there's a landscape in the background. The works before had gotten very sort of metaphysical um, and they had become very abstract uh, in, in that sense. And so there's an attempt to re uh, render a landscape. Uh, the, uh, they have very naturalistic halos, which you know, they, they, they kind of look like fish globes to us. But uh, that naturalistic halo um, is really sort of showing, they're trying to show that, that, that the head is kind of glowing, right? Um, and when we look at the, 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 the square boxes, right, and the books, you know, books are square, uh, the writing stands and the little benches that are in there, right, they're trying to draw those from observation. And these ones in particular uh, resonate with me because these to me look like when I assign people to draw boxes and they don't understand the perspective system. So there's an attempt to measure, right? We're using our knitting needles and whatnot, and we're trying to measure, and we're trying to observe, but it's not quite coming out right, right? So the idea is there, but, the, but if they don't have anything that locks it together. Mm -hmm. right? After this short period, um, things again um, become much more metaphysical, and, uh, and they become more abstract. Right? Uh, and then we sort of cruise up towards the Renaissance. Right? <clears throat> this is a painting by Giotto. Uh, Giotto is uh, one of the masters of the early Renaissance. He's a very important painting, uh, um, painter in the history of, uh, of, the, of, the, Ren of the Renaissance. Uh, and this is uh, a painting, uh, a fresco painting, on the Arena Chapel, which is in, in Padua. And one of the really interesting things about Giotto and and his, um, his his sort of place in history is that um, he's becoming very interested in um, in telling narratives and stories. And he lives in a city that has a university, but even more importantly, it has a theater. And all of the paintings that Giotto do, um, does, they have this sort of quality that looks theatrical because he's trying to tell stories and he's trying to create sets. Right? And if you are trying to create a set, you need to draw them to look a particular way. And so his drawings, are the, the underdrawings of his paintings, um, they're, they're very naturalistic. They're very much observed. Um, they're very competent. Uh, but, they're, but they're kind of missing a couple of little pieces, right? So um, if you look up at the top corner, and, and all of it, so if you look at the, um, down at the bottom actually, or look at the little crate down there, right? And uh, uh, just below the money changers, who Jesus is getting particularly mad at right now, right? And, but we're looking at the little crate down at the bottom, right? And you can see that the back section of the crate, right? is farther away from us, yet it's the same size as the front section, uh, or this front line I'm showing here. All right, and if we go up to the, to the, to the back, right, if you look at the windows in the, in the, upper, uh, in the upper left, right, the window in back appears to be larger than the window in the front. But when we measure them, they're actually the same size. Right? So what John is doing is so he just he's taking this one and he's moving it over and he's saying that that's the same thing. Right? Um, he he's he's rendering some things to be smaller that are farther away, but not not all of them. Okay. All right. So um, fast forward a, a few years, right? and I'm going to tell you a, a little story that's a little bit of myth, probably because um, it comes from. Uh, Vasari and uh, the lives of, uh, of the painters, which was um, a, itself a work of art, and, uh, and Vasari took uh, some liberties, probably. Mm -hmm. right, and we're going to uh, talk a little bit about 
basically how perspective was said to be discovered. Right? Uh, and, that, and where we are is we're standing on the steps of uh, um, the dome in, in Florence. It's called Il Duomo, uh, the, the Great Dome. Uh, and you should be studying that in your art history classes, I hope. Right? And we're taking a look at the baptistery, which is seven. So in, um, uh, in, in, in the early, before the Renaissance, when this, this, this chapel was built, it was a Romanesque chapel, and in Italian Romanesque chapels, they are uh, the baptistery, where the baptisms are, is separate from the cathedral. Right? So it's a separate building that's across the street from, uh, from the dome. And, uh, and they devised this experiment. Right? And so if you're doing an experiment, anyone who's, who's done an experiment, you probably have a little bit of an idea um, as to what, um, what the outcome may or may not be. And so there's this kind of idea that, um, you know, that, that this all just was this magical thing, but I, I think really that they, they, they kind of had an idea of what, what they were going to find and then sought to, to, to demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. And so what they did is they set up uh, two easels Right, according to the story, right, they set up two easels, and on one they put a blank canvas, and on the other one uh, they put a mirror. Right? And so they uh, they're facing backwards. Right? And then um, and, and you have to understand that uh, that a mirror in this time period was an extremely extremely rare thing. Right? So they, uh, they the glass that they did have. Uh, was very wavy and you couldn't see through it clearly. So the mirrors that we have today, um, either you know, if they're older mirrors, they have silver painted on them, or they, they have reflective plastics that we put on the back of them. Uh, so mirrors are super common to us. But uh, in you know around 1500, uh, they were not. That was not a very um, uh, normal object. They would only have mirrors if you had pieces of metal that were polished to perfection. Right? So they were, they were very rare and expensive and not normal. Uh, the reason why I bring that up is that if they were all walking around with iPhone cameras, uh, they would have discovered these principles immediately because uh, it, it's, it's, it's very obvious when, when someone explains it to you. Right? So what they did is they put the, the mirror on one side, they put the canvas on the other side, and then using the same types of skills and angle measurements and ca calipers that we uh, were using with our knitting needles, right? they, they looked in the thing, there's a batch suit behind us, and they just transferred the image from one side to the other. Because right? you're looking in the mirror, you're looking at what you're painting, and you just put a line there, and you move it over, and you put the line there. It's, uh, it's, it's very easy. Right? And then what they did, right? and then what they did, is they went and they cut a hole in the back of the, of, of the, uh, of the painting, and then they stood in front of the, uh, um, they stood in front of, or behind the painting, right, looking at the baptistery, and they would take the mirror and move the mirror back and forth, and they came to this realization, they, they had done something that was exact, right? And it's a, this stuff is all kind of legend, right? But the point is, is that what they basically did is they made a photorealistic type copy of something, right? And then were able to plot out various lines from that. And, and the important part about it is what they discovered, right? Quote, discovered, right? Uh, what they discovered was that all parallel lines recede to a common point. Right? So if you have any two things, right? So take it right here, right? If you have any two things, right, that are parallel, right, this line is parallel to this line, right? If you have any two things that are parallel right, in the real world, right, that when you put them on an angle, right, so as an example again, right, parallel and parallel, when you put them on an angle like this, they will recede to a point somewhere. Right? Uh, and this is a place where you know sometimes people, you, um, you know, they, there's not some little dot out there. There's this point where if those lines were to continue on forever, right, at some point in time they get so small that they that they just appear to become a singularity, right? and we call and we're calling that a point. Right? After that, this is what we see. Right? So um, this painting, this space is much more naturalistic. Right? Um, this is the Holy Trinity by Masaccio, uh, also known as Sloppy Tom. Right? And in this painting, you feel like you could go jump up on top of this and walk around behind the altar 
right? Um, you know, you could you could walk past the two patrons, right? You could walk past the two sta saints, right? Slide around back, right? Because that space feels real and naturalistic. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what they developed was a system that artists could later use, right? And that's the important part. And that system is not complex. Right? We want it to be extremely complex, but the system is basically this. All parallel lines recede to a common point. That's all you got to remember. Right? That's all you got to remember. Nothing more. All right? All right, so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's pause there, right? and then uh, we're going to take a look at the three different types of linear perspective. So let's dig in a little bit to the perspective system itself. Right? In order to get started, the first thing we have to talk about is a horizon line. Right? So your horizon line is basically your eye level. Okay? So it's your eye level. Right? So if I go down, my eye level goes down. If I go up, my eye level goes up. Right? So uh, what, your, what we call the horizon line, um, which is maybe, maybe we should just all just call it the eye level because that's what it is. Right? The way I always describe it is imagine whatever room you're sitting in, right? um, imagine if the room just filled up with water right up to your eyeballs. Right? And you sort of look out across whatever room you're in right? and, and, you're like, and you say, um, is this object above or below my eye level? Right? So this stick is above my eye level. This little head is below my eye level. Okay, so that's what that's what it actually is. Right, um, and then you can find certain things. Right, if I go, uh, if, I go if I extend this out, right? this ankle right here, right, is is right on my eye level. Right? So we represent that eye level with. Um, a single line that goes all the way across, right? And it's important to think about first, like what is above that and what is below that. Okay. The next thing that we are going to want to, uh, um, to identify is a focal point. Okay. So a focal point is the center of your image. A camera, um, a camera has only one lens, so it automatically just goes to where, uh, where, where that thing is pointed. Right? Why the focal point is important for us to identify in doing a drawing is that if I'm, if, if I'm looking this way, right, right, my focal point is right in front of my eyes. It's a, it's a place where my eyes come together. Okay? Think about Cyclops from the X-Men. Right? He lifts up his ruby uh, glasses and the laser shoots out. Right? It's shooting out towards the point. Now, if, if I look up, my focal point goes over here. And if I look down, my focal point goes on there. And then if I look over there, it's going that way. And if I look up there, it's going that way. Every time you change where you're basically looking, right, um, all of the angles that you're measuring are going to be different. Right? So this is a really common problem when people start drawing larger spaces. Right? Is The reason why all their measurements aren't coming out correct is actually because they're looking all over the, the place. Right? So you think about it like a camera. If you took a picture like this, and then you moved over just a little bit, click, they're two different pictures. Right? So if you're doing a drawing and you're measuring stuff over here, but then you're looking over here, right, you're going to get two different sets of measurements because you're looking at two different things. Right? Um, that doesn't mean that you need to wear a neck brace when you're, uh, when, when you're, um, when you're, when you're measuring out a drawing. Right? But you do have to generally look in the same place. And whatever that place is, is going to be the center of your drawing. Okay? That is your focal point. <clears throat> um, here is an example of, uh, of you know, the, the classic one-point uh, um, perspective. Right? So you got a set of uh, rails, and they go off, and, it, and when they get to the, a certain point, they become uh, a single dot. Right? This is basic one-point perspective. Right? Uh, the whole thing about using train rails as an example, um, or, or you could use omega, omega beams if you, if you want, but I think the train tracks is probably an easier one for most people. Right? If, you, uh, if you get on a train in New York, headed for California, 
you're not worried that by the time you, you know, at any point in time, that the tracks are going to converge. Right? You know that the tracks in New York are a certain uh, um, amount of space apart, right? and you know that in, uh, when, when they uh, arrive in California, they're still the same distance. Yet when you stand on a railroad track and look down, right, they recede away. Okay? All right, so uh, going with that sort of classic one point uh, perspective, right? Here we have a box that's sitting below our line, right? And when the box sits below our line, right, uh, it, the, the lines that are parallel to each other, right, all parallel lines recede to a common point. The lines that are parallel to each other uh, will recede to a point. Right? If that point is parallel or perpendicular to the ground plane, it will be on the horizon line. Right? That, that's, that's just the way it is. At some point in time, that line is just going to appear to be, because the distance from here to whatever ground is, it's, it's so minimal as it gets away, it's going to appear to be a single dot. Right? If boxes are above, right, you can see these three lines are all parallel to each other, right, and they uh, are receiving to that same point. Right? If it is sitting right on your eye line, you can see here that this one, um, uh, that the lines go uh, just to, the, to that point. Okay. Right. The flaw, the flaw in, in, in this though, is that look at this line and this line. Mm -hmm. if, if you were standing uh, right in the center of this, right, which line would be closer to you, A or B? Mm -hmm. A would be closer to you, and therefore it should be larger, but those two lines, when drawn this way, uh, are, are, um, appear to be the same. Right? This is more in line with what we actually see most of the time. Right? So here we're looking at a table, right? and you can see that uh, all, of, all of these lines uh, are, are parallel, and they all recede to a point over here, and you can see that all of these lines are parallel and they recede to a point over here. Now it's important to note that the bottom, there's, there's a, a line, right, and, and the, the orthogonal line, right, that goes off to the vanishing point, um, that the bottom of the table legs, right, that line here and this line here are parallel to each other, right, so they will also go to that same place and they share a line. Right? If you come in uh, with your box from Amazon, and that's a nice big box from Amazon, you must have gotten something good, uh, a big brand new set of Legos or something. Okay. Right? Uh, you come in with your, uh, your box and you put it on the table, right? and if you line up the, the um, things so that they're parallel, they will also recede to those same points. Right? However, what we know is that we don't always put all of our boxes uh, perfectly on the table. Right? So if you put it in a way where the sides of the box are not parallel to the sides of the table, they will then go to different perspective points. Okay? So if, uh, if, if, if a box is, is turned on the table, right? and you can see the pattern that's about to start to develop, if we were to animate this, Right? is all we would do is continue to move those perspective points. So, so those perspective points, they, they move away from us like this. Right? And if you, were to, if you were to rotate that, right, they would keep going around and around and around like that. Okay? Right? For all my folks who want to be animators, right, there's a, right? here's a, a, an example, uh, um, a standard oil uh, gas station here. Uh, I, I, I love this one because you know, when you're, when you're looking at it, you can see all these parallel lines, right? And these parallel lines clearly identify exactly where we are, which is strangely laying on the ground outside a gas station in the middle of the night. So, you know, the life of artists. Mm -hmm. um, just as you don't always have to put the box perfectly on the table, sometimes you know, who knows, maybe there's an apple underneath one side of it, or you know, or you just decide to tip the box up, right? When you tip the box up, this is what happens, right? Uh, when you tip the box up, uh, you enter into a three-point perspective system, 
question, right? Now, in truth, we're always seeing things in three-point perspective because we live in a three-dimensional world and things are moving away from us in an X, Y, and Z axis. But to go back to the two-point perspective system, when we're in certain types of rooms, right, we tend to not really see that activated all the time. I'll talk more about that when I, um, when I do my demo. Right? But uh, you can see here that uh, we're activating the third perspective point because the object is no longer or the, the planes or the, or the sets of parallel lines, the planes are no longer parallel or perpendicular to the ground plane. And therefore, um, you are showing the, the third perspective point. Okay? Now, there are two different times when we use the third perspective point. The first one is this example where the box tips up. Right? The second time when we show the third per perspective point is when our focal point leaves the eye line. Okay, the eye level, the horizon line. Right? So um, in that example, we see something like this. So what has happened here in this example is that our eyes have moved down below and the focal point is now in the center. Right? The focal point is now in the center. And because the focal point is now in the center, uh, the bottom of that long column is moving away. Right? There's sort of an example of that. That's, that's a self-portrait of me up in the corner, by the way. <laughs> right? So you're flying along in the city. Um, you're looking for a place to land your helicopter. Right? Um, I get a cape, but you get a helicopter, so I think that that's actually a, a pretty, pretty good deal. Right? So you're flying along looking for a place to, uh, to, to land your helicopter, so you're looking down. Right? Because you are up high above the buildings, your eye level, all right, your horizon line, is up high. It's above the buildings. Right? And you're looking down, and because you're looking down, you can see that all the things that are um, you know, going this way are going to this perspective point, all the things that are going this way, um, even the ones that are down, way down low, uh, where all of those little tiny people are, right, are going this direction, right? and then all of the sides of the building are all moving away from you because the bottom of the building is farther away from you than the top of the building. Yeah? So uh, I'm going to pause there again, uh, and that's sort of uh, the, that's the basics of you know, one, two, and three point perspective. Right? The main things that you uh, you you want to remember are establish a clear focal point, right? a place where you're looking, right? establish your eye level. Right? Um, are you looking up above your eye level? Are you looking below your eye level? Or you're just looking sort of basically across at your eye level. Right? Um, in a one-point perspective, it's like looking down a hallway, everything's going to be receding to a single point. Right? In a two-point perspective system, things are going to be receding uh, um, uh, to, one, uh, to, two point, to two separate points. In a three-point perspective system, right, things are going to be moving towards those two points and as well uh, down. Three to, uh, two times that you introduce that third perspective point, one is when you look away from your horizon line, and the third is when the box or whatever object that you're drawing in the parallel, um, when the planes are not parallel or perpendicular to the ground plane that you're standing on. All right, uh, so uh, let's take a look at, uh, at a couple of photographs, and, um, and I'll talk about how those work. So here we are taking a look at a still image of the corner of my studio. Now, when we're looking at perspective and we're doing this type of analysis that, we're, that you're gonna be doing, um, and let me just sort of also say that what I'm going to demonstrate uh, to you in the next two images uh, is basically, or is the exact same thing that I'm asking you to do for your homework assignment. So you wanna pay attention to how I'm sort of thinking about it, um, especially. Right? So the first thing that we're doing is we're going to analyze things, right? We're going to take a quick look and we're going to try to identify um, uh, you know, what is above my eye level, right? what would be above the water and what is below my eye level. And you just, just look and see that, right? All right? So you can see there's a bunch of uh, tabletops, 
um, are, are bench tops, and you can see that you can see the tops of some of those things. So you know you have a, gen a little bit of a general idea of where things are going to sort of um, come together. Okay? The next thing we want to do is we want to look at sets of lines that we think may or may not be parallel. Right? Sometimes you, know, you can have a, um, a shelf that's off. And we can all tell when a picture frame is, is, is a little bit leaning one direction or the other. So you want to look at the things that you think are good. Right? So um, I know because I built that wall that that wall is straight and parallel and perpendicular to the ground plane. I know all those floorboards are good. Right? So, so I'm going to take a look at the top of the, uh, of the wall in the back and just one of any one of the floorboards, all right? And I'm gonna bring those up. And then I'm also going to use one of the, the shelves, all right? And you notice if I extend out those lines, what ends up happening is they all converge on a common point, all right? That is my perspective point. You do not have to go in and do every single floorboard, all right? I guarantee you though that every one of those floorboards is going to go to that exact same spot. Now, however, if we were doing a longer drawing, which I'll do in the demonstration, right, um, we would then use that same perspective point in order to establish all those floorboards. But for this analysis, that's, that's just wasting time, right? These should be able to be done in a few minutes, right? So now let's, uh, let's take a look at the ones going on the other side. So if you notice, these ones that I've plotted out, right, they are not parallel to the other ones. Right? So they, it, in, instead, they go to a perspective point that is on the other side. Right? And you can see that based on the angle that I've chosen, right, the one perspective point is in my image and the other one is way off to the left. Right? That's just where it goes. Right? If you extend those lines out, that's where they go. Right? There's no, no two ways about it. So sometimes if we're doing a drawing, maybe we have to tape a couple of extra pieces of paper to the side and uh, in order to plot out our perspective point. Right? You'll frequently see in painter's studios, people are working on big giant paintings, uh, that they'll have a couple of nail, uh, nails stuck in the wall with strings attached. Right? And those strings they're using to just make sure that their perspective stays, uh, stays in check. Right? Uh, a lot of the digital programs that, uh, that we're all using, uh, you know, Photoshop and Procreate and all those, they have, they have a perspective function. So you can actually lock in those things as well. Right? But you can't use those functions in those programs if you don't understand the system. Right? So that's what this is all about. Right? So once I have those two things, right, is all I have to do is draw a line across. Right? Because remember, if the, if, if the planes, which two, and two lines, right? uh, two lines equal, make a plane, right? if the plane is parallel or perpendicular, Right? meaning it's either a wall or it's a flat tabletop. If it's parallel, if the plane is parallel or perpendicular to the ground plane, the perspective point will be on the horizon line. So if we're looking at these sets of parallel and perpendicular planes, right, as we extend them out, we can then use the two points in order to establish where our horizon line is. Right? So this is what I'm asking you to do for your homework. Right? The simple question is, did you establish the horizon line? That's basically what I'm looking for. So here you can see I'm using a, a different colored line, uh, a red line for that one. Okay, all right, let's take a look at an exterior view, all right? So here's an exterior view, all right? So uh, just the same thing, all right? I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna first look at the, uh, at the structure, all right? Uh, you're going to have better luck with these if you if you look at a corner, right? If you're looking straight on, you're not going to see anything. But if you look at a corner of, of a house like this is, right, you'll see all the pieces of clapboard on the side, right? Um, you can line up, depending, you can line up the various windows, right? That's a really good indicator. If all of those windows are all parallel, right? Sometimes you can have, you know, old houses that have like windows all over the place and um, you know, different, different kinds of things. Or even if you look at the front of this house, some of the windows in the front of the house, right, are not, uh, are, will be going in a different direction. So I'm only gonna choose the ones that are square. All right, so here I'm lining up under the bottom. I'm using this, the top of the house. Now as uh, this house has like a little pediment on the, on the top of it, uh, a pediment feature, those parts of the slope of the roof, those are not 
um, what I'm going to use. I'm using the side of the, of the roof, all right? And then a little bit of the side of the porch there. All right? And we go over to the other side, all right? And again, same thing. Here, um, the bottoms of the windows, right, are all lining up. Uh, because I have to go far away, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of far away from this house. If I was really close, I could see all the clapboard a little bit easier, but um, all right, I'm using one of the stairs at the bottom and then the bottom of that little pediment feature. And again, you see that those all line up. And then when we add in uh, and when we connect those two points, there's a flat line and that tells you exactly where I was standing or right where my, or it's not even where my head was actually, because uh, we don't look through a camera lens the way we used to. It tells me, ex tells you exactly where I was holding my iPhone and where my iPhone was when, uh, when I took this picture. Okay. All right. So, uh, your homework for this week, which is in e-learning, your homework for this week is to do three, uh, is to do this exact same process on six different images, three interior views and three exterior views. All right. Um, they shouldn't be hard. They should only take you, uh, you know, you know, five minutes at, at most each, all right. You know, probably a couple of minutes really quickly. And it, it's not about how many different lines you draw all over it. It's about whether you accurately um, establish the horizon line, right? That, that you accurately tell me where the viewer, i.e. the camera, uh, you know, um, uh, where that camera was when that image was taken, all right? A uh, couple of things that I will say in addition to that. Uh, one, you can do this digitally if you want, all right? I did this in Adobe Illustrator because that was way easier. Uh, a long time ago, I used to... Uh, um, I used to have people print out pictures and we would tape them down and we would draw lines all over them. Uh, and that's, that's just totally unnecessary. Uh, so uh, you can use any, any of the, the various sort of um, you know, programs uh, to do, do it digitally. It's totally fine. And if not, you can do it uh, the old fashioned way. Uh, you could always just tear, um, uh, you know, cut some pictures out of like a, a magazine catalog or something like that if you if you have to uh if you don't want to go get your own things printed uh, i would prefer if you took your own photos okay i would prefer that but i understand that um that that's sometimes so those people who choose to do this assignment digitally uh taking your own photo is actually easier um if you have to print that somehow and that's and that's difficult for you then then that's a, that's not necessary all right. Uh, so uh, hopefully this helps you to get a better understanding of perspective. Uh, next week, I will be doing a, a, a drawing of an interior space and showing you how to reverse engineer this whole process uh, in order to create uh, a drawing of a space. I'll see you next week.